Hi, my name is Dr. John Duyard. In today's podcast, I want to talk about an Ayurvedic substance called AMA, A-M-A. AMA is undigested food particles, undigested food toxins that build up in the tissues in the body linked to a host of health concerns, degenerative health concerns. So there's environmental pollutants, there's uh, food toxins that we don't break down or detoxify properly, and there's also something called mental AMA or mental and emotional AMA. So we can have toxins from the mindset that might be out of balance. We can have toxins from the environment or AMA from the environment, and we can have AMA from our digestion. All of those are really important, which is why you don't want to just go and detoxify the body because the reason why the body got toxins in the first place is because it wasn't able to detoxify properly. So if you go and chelate, detox your body and pull all the stuff out of, into your blood, your body doesn't know what to do with it. So it ends up just moving oftentimes the toxins from one fat cell to another where Ayurveda was like, wait a minute, let's try to understand how the body got toxic in the first place. Did it happen from lymphatic congestion? Was it conge AMA in the digestion from constipation and diarrhea? Was it imbalances in the upper digestive system, the coordinate effort of your stomach making acid, liver making bile, pancreas and duodenal making digestive enzymes? Or did it take place in your mind as stress incurring mental and emotional AMA that actually may have started the whole process. So I wanna talk a little bit about understanding the whole chain of events that could, have take, that could have gotten you to a place where you actually need a detox. And then when you do a detox, you wanna think, oh, I shouldn't just go and detox myself, I should reset function, digestive function, liver function, lymph function, as well as understanding how to unravel some of the mental and emotional AMA, the, the, the mindsets that we have that uh, may be, in fact, from the Ayurvedic perspective, are actually the cause of disease. In Ayurveda, the cause of disease is what's called the, the, the mistake of the intellect, where our mind starts, because of stress, starts to think of itself as separate from the whole. You know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So when the body starts to function not as a whole, but starts to function as individual parts, this is the Ayurvedic understanding of the cause of disease, right? So the mind, as any of us can probably, you know, uh, kind of uh, believe, that is the, is the thing that incurs the most stress in, in our life. You know, this crazy mind of ours creates stress, and that stress just plows through our intestinal tract, our digestive system, alters our microbiology. That microbiology sends another message back to the brain. The brain sends a message to everybody to get alert. This is an emergency, and we go into a survival degenerative emergency response. And many of us live a lifestyle like that. So then you think, okay, where did this mindset of survival come from? Well, Ayurveda says that that mindset of survival comes from stress, emotional stress. Studies show that in the first six years of your life, we have these impressions that we experience, and those impressions we experience in the first six years of our life make up, this is a crazy number, but 95% of the things we think and say and do as adults. So 95% of the stuff we do as adults comes from impressions we experience in the first six years of our life. So which means that we're thinking and talking and speaking as adults sort of in an unconscious way because we're completely basing it on these really, really old, old childlike impressions, which were all based on survival. When you're a young kid, you want attention. You want mom and dad to love you, care for you. And we, as young kids, are really good at manipulating mom and dad as well. And, you know, and we have this hard wiring to want the approval of mom and dad. And if we get it, uh, we feel a little bit safer. Okay, and if we didn't have that need for the approval, mom and dad wouldn't watch over us, we would wander in the jungle, get eaten by lions, and there'd be no people here. So it's clearly part of our survival, this need for the reward chemistry, right? Problem is our culture has just taken that whole reward chemistry to a whole nother level. Now, it used to be kids would grow up, they would go through rites of passage, they would stop needing love from mom and dad and start actually being their own independent self without needing more and more love and attention and approval from others. Now we have a culture where, you know, we feel good when we go shopping, we feel good when we get a cup of coffee, we feel good when we buy something, a bigger house, a bigger car, more money, more of this, more of that. 
we become addicted to that reward chemistry. So then along the way, you can have emotional trauma where you don't get that reward or you get hurt feelings along the way. And Ayurveda says that those feelings are experienced in our heart, something called sadhaka pitta. And I've written articles about that if you want to read more about that. That's the emotional heart. And it's called S-A-D-H-A-K-A. And that feels these emotional traumas and, it, and that, that, that trauma is carried into our brain and, and through an aspect of vata called prana vata. And then that prana literally writes these impressions in a part of our brain called tarpaka, which literally means to record. So those old impressions are written into the white matter of our brain, which is where the myelin sheaths are, which are like a waxy sheath that protects the nerves. So this is the understanding Ayurveda had, was that these old emotional impressions that we have from way, way back when and throughout our lives, they're written and recorded in the white matter of our brain. And they make us think and do the same dumb stuff again and again and again in our lives, creating mental, emotional ama, toxins that are not serving us. Those mental, emotional patterns of behavior helped us when we were young kids to survive our childhood. But now as adults, they're not serving us any longer. They have become ama. They have become a problem. So if you were, for example, um, a caveman or cave woman thousands of years ago and you ran into, when you were a young kid, you ran into a cave and a lion came out and chased you. And then you're 95 years and you old and now you ended up going back to that cave. You would remember that a lion chased you out of that cave a long time ago. So we're, we are, our survival uh, mechanisms to keep our species alive is designed to record those survival traumas so we don't have to go do those again and they get written into the white matter which is inside of your brain not the outside cortex but the inside so it's kind of protected so we store that so that tarpaka kapha also has to do with cerebral spinal fluid which is the brainwashing fluid and that brainwashing fluid is basically lymph cerebral spinal fluid what is in your brain is called cerebral spinal fluid that same stuff when it's outside of your brain and it moves in and out, uh, is called lymph. So it's basically brain lymphs, and they have now discovered that there are, in fact, brain lymphs. In University of Virginia, about 10 years ago, they discovered that there were brain lymphatics that drain to the tune of three pounds of chemicals and plaque out of your head every year while you sleep at night. And they uh, have since found that those brain lymphatics, when they're congested, are linked to anxiety, depression, cognitive decline, infection, inflammation, and even autoimmune concerns. So all of a sudden now, we have the science that says, yep, they, even though for hundreds of years now, Western medicine would say there's no lymphs in the brain at all, Ayurveda said uh, there are lymphs in the brain, they're in the ventricles of the brain, and they call that tarpaka kapha. And when you breathe and move and do certain techniques, you can move that cerebral spinal fluid and wash those lymphs out of your brain and, can, and move those toxins out of your brain in a more efficient manner. Ayurveda said that emotional trauma can cause the accumulation of these brain toxins or this ama in the brain. And it's sort of like, you know, when bad things happen to us in our life, we all have experienced situations where um, we grieve. It's very, very painful, but somehow we figure out a way to forge on and move on in our life. And that's what the Tarpa Kakafa does. It sort of protects the brain from that emotional trauma and allows us to then uh, sort of forge on. So Ayurveda said, um, Ayurveda said that these this tarpaka kapha, when it gets traumatized and it holds on, and it holds on to those old impressions written in the white matter of your brain, they can be unraveled. So the brain lymphs that they found that they were right across the top of your head, like a sagittal sinus right here and across the back of your head called the transverse sinus, that's where Ayurveda said they were. That's when they found them in you know, the University of Virginia. That's exactly where they were up to 50% of those brain lymphs drain through the lymphs in your nose and their sinuses. And Ayurveda developed techniques called nausea to sniff oil, medicated oil, <coughs> excuse me, up into the sinuses to help encourage a, a, a detoxification of those brain lymphatics. They developed that thousands of years ago. I have an article called nausea, N-A-S-Y-A, 
sinus cleansing and emotional baggage. Just type that in at lifespa.com and read this whole article about how to actually do that technique on your own to clean out these brain lymphatics because the brain lymphatics, if they're congested and we're holding on to old emotional trauma, then we're gonna do the same dumb stuff again and again and again based on a trauma we experienced in the first six years of our life. And we need to move on from that. And so Ayurveda was like, we can do better. We don't have to ride the, the bottom of the ocean in a survival may, way, hitting every bump, you know, and, 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 and kind, of, kind of dragging ourselves through the survival mud where we can raise, in a way, lack of a better word, our vibration, be above the fray, and not live in a survival state all the time. This was the Ayurvedic way to literally become conscious. So instead of being unconscious, with 95% of your stuff that you're thinking and saying and doing comes from compressions from the first six years of our life, we're talking about becoming conscious. And that's one of the techniques, I'm gonna talk about a handful of them, to unravel the mental ama that makes us do the same dumb stuff. And don't think that that mental ama doesn't impact your gut. Your bugs in your gut feel all that stress. They know when you're engaging in some type of manipulation to get approval and appreciation from others, and they know when they're safe and secure. So if I was sitting next to a social disruptor who was really stressed out, the bugs in my gut wouldn't change and become stressed out simply because I was sitting next to a social disruptor, someone that was really stressed out. So our bugs are designed to feel everything. And if the, we ate some food with a pesticide on it and the microbes, their genetics were mutated and that came into my gut, or I was emotionally stressed in my gut from a social disruptor or a trauma, then that genetic material carrying that information goes, with, goes through our intestinal wall through a process called horizontal transfer of genetic material from the genetics of the bugs in your gut to your genetic code to tell your genetic code that there's some weird stuff happening out there and you better get ready and prepare yourself genetically so those weird pesticides or bugs or mutations or trauma or stress or whatever don't take out your body because the bugs wanna make sure that we stay alive because we provide a home for them, which is really important. So, so we carry this stress, we feel everything. So mental and emotional stress, AMA, from impressions from early on in our lives, get written in the white mat of our brain, make us think and say the same stuff again and again and again, do repetitive patterns of behavior that don't serve you, they plow through your gut, irritate your gut, change your microbiome, and that microbiome then sends a message back to your brain to send emergency messages to your whole body, and however you are genetically encoded to break down as you get older, you often do. And you find yourself mentally and emotionally living in a way where you just don't feel content. We, like I said a minute ago, we stay in that childlike mindset where if I get a nicer car or a bigger house or a, pair, a new pair of shoes or this or that, I feel so much better. So my happiness is dependent on reward chemistry, right? That's my happiness. Where in Ayurveda, they're like, eh, that doesn't really work like that. Ayurveda was like creating a sattvic environment, a loving giving, caring environment. And that's what will make us live the longest and raise ourselves up the, uh, above the, the fray of survival mechanics to a level of becoming conscious and being aware of when you are doing you, letting who you truly are out, and when you are engaging in behavior to manipulate your environment to give you the love and the approval and the appreciation of others. I wrote an article once um, called The Difference Between Eudaimonic Giving and Hedonistic Giving. And eudaimonic giving is when you just give <clears throat> from your heart because you love to give. You don't get anything in return. Hedonistic giving is when I give, but I, I, I hope you like it. And I have some attachment and expectation that when I give this to you, somehow I'm going to feel good about it. So I have a little bit of a hook involved. I'm expecting to get some emotional level of satisfaction. Where eudaimonic giving is just, I just give fully and I love the giving. It's the, it's the, it's the, the, the giving for the joy of giving with no return on that investment. 
when they measured the genetic impact of that, when they gave hedonistically with a hope to get something in return, it actually had a negative impact on their health and their genetic code. When I gave eudaimonically, it had a positive impact on their health and genetic code, which means that when I'm doing me and I'm just loving fully, you can tell the difference between when I'm hoping to give you something, but to get something in return. So when I'm giving fully, you can tell the difference. And that's the beautiful thing. Now I had a, so, so that means that we have this unconscious version, which is based on needing approval from mom and dad. And we have this conscious version of us, which just loves to give like the sun. It just shines light and just gives. And it's just a great feeling to do that. Right? So it's a, it's a, 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 a really important piece of the puzzle to understand that when you give uh, fully, you are more satisfied. They can tell the difference between that. So <clears throat> I once had a, uh, I was in teaching at a seminar years ago in, in the Omega Institute. And one of my students raised her hand and said, so you're telling me that the human nature is basically love. And I was like, yeah. And she goes, you have any proof of that? And at that point, it was many years ago, I didn't, but now I do. So when you give in a loving eudaimonic way, m some major things happen. One, we know that your genetic, your, your, your microbes, your good beneficial microbes proliferate and your bad microbes disappear. We know that when I'm sitting next to a stressful person, my bugs will change in a negative way. We also know that there's a hormone called oxytocin, which is the love giving bonding hormone, also called the longevity hormone. And the more I give in love and care for others, the more oxytocin, this longevity hormone I make. The opposite hormone is dopamine, which is the reward chemistry hormone. The more I uh, stimulate myself to get a reward when I work really hard to make a lot of money to buy something, I get that reward. I need more of that stimulation, more sugar, more candy, more drug, whatever it is, I'm going to need more of that to get the same, more stimulation to get the same reward. Where oxytocin, the more you love to give and care for others, you get more oxytocin and it never runs out. Meditation is a calming experience that's been shown with Nobel Prize winning science to extend your telomeres, which are a measurement of longevity. Studies show that when you're under stress, Elizabeth Blackburn did that years ago and found that when you're under stress, your telomeres, the, the, the caps on your chromosomes shrink and it's linked to accelerated aging. And when you meditate, find yourself in a peaceful, loving state, a sattvic environment, your telomeres begin to lengthen. Um, it just goes on and on and on about the science that suggests that we do better when we become conscious, when we don't continue to live the 95% of the things that we're thinking and saying based on survival, needing of approval impressions when we were young, young little kids, right? We don't need to stay in that place. We can become conscious. So Ayurveda developed all these really cool techniques to do that. But you can see where I'm going with this is if we don't get rid of the mental ama that plows the gut, alters your intestinal microbiome, alters your digestion, and now we begin to have these physical techniques like ama and, uh, and, men and physical ama building up in the body that causes toxins that need to be detoxified. So in like our Ayurvedic cleanses, like our Colorado cleanse, it was always about you know, restoring digestive function, restoring lymphatic flow, restoring function of your liver and your gallbladder and your bile, turning on your digestive fire. And once we did all those things, then we go and chelate the impurities out of the fat cells and how important with that is. In the Colorado Cleanse, in the, in the book, there's a whole series of self-inquiry exercises, which are really important because when you're in that state of detox and you're burning fat and you're detoxing fat, and by the way, AMA is always fat, so the ama from your mind is fat soluble toxins, molecules of emotion. Candace Pert wrote in her book years ago that are stored in the fat in your brain, the myelin sheaths, the ama in your fat cells. These are where the toxins are. The environmental pollutants are fat soluble. So when you burn fat, you detoxify physical and mental and emotional ama out of your body. So, so when you're burning fat, and you're in doing a cleanse and you're detoxifying that, what better time to do the self-inquiry so you can restructure new behavioral patterns of behavior, create new levels of what's called neuroplasticity in your brain. So the technique I was talking about, the nausea technique, there was an article in that article called Nausea, Sinus Cleansing and Emotional Baggage. 
I wrote about a story about a patient of mine many years ago who came to me, had a goiter in her neck about the size of a grapefruit. And uh, she had hyperthyroidism. hyperthyroidism. Her numbers in her thyroid were very, very high. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and, um, and she wanted to do an Ayurvedic cleanse. And her med I worked with her medical doctor, and he, he, we worked and did some cleansing with her. And one of the techniques was this nausea technique, which from the Ayurvedic perspective was always to release old emotional trauma. That's what the technique was about. And so she did that, and because it's always very powerful and we're always trying to unwrap the mental and emotional you know, patterns of behavior and trauma first, because that's what caused the gut, and that gut caused digestive issues, and digestive issues caused ama and toxins and, and chronic imbalances, right? So that's the, how we have to work it, and that's what's so beautiful about Ayurveda, and all the Ayurveda cleanses are about understanding you gotta go upstream, right? So, the, so she, she did this cleanse, and after she did her third one of these nausea techniques that clean out the brain lymphatics, um, she had this epiphany. And she said, I was, I was sitting there, and I had this epiphany where I was watching myself being abused when I was 14 years old. And she said, it was really weird because I hadn't thought about that, even remembered that in so many, many decades, but it was weird that all of a sudden I'm sitting there watching that. And she said, what was really amazing, even more so, was that I wasn't affected by the event so much. I was more struck by my life before the event and my life after the event. Before the event, I saw myself as this happy-go-lucky child having just a great happy time. Then this thing happened, and then after that, I saw myself as this type A, hyper-vigilant, 90-hour-a-week corporate executive perfectionist. Everything was perfect, and she's put so much energy into her being perfect the best she could, um, color-coded closet, everything was dressed perfect to the hill, everything was perfect, and that was sort of her survival. And she realized that she had burned out her adrenals and her blood sugar, and now her thyroid was exploding, exploding as a result of that stress and that trauma. And she said what was really interesting was I saw my, my life before and my life after, and I saw that event, and she said that wasn't, that's not worth 25 years of my life, and she said, I just dropped it. And when she just dropped it, she was just free of that, of that process because her brain lymphatics were able to kind of cleanse through the tarpaka kapha, the brain lymphatic cleansing fluids, cerebral spinal fluid, and move that through these newly discovered brain lymphatics that Ayurveda talked about and developed techniques to clean out thousands of years ago. Her thyroid goiter, when in the week of the Ayurvedic Panchakarma, which I administered for about 26 years, which is Ayurvedic detox in retreat, um, disappeared in one week. True story, in, in her thyroid numbers came down 300, 400 points in that week, and then a few, six or nine months later, uh, her thyroid completely normalized. A few years ago, I saw her at a Christmas party in Denver, and she came running up to me with two uh, five, six-year-old little kids in tow, telling me that you know this wouldn't happen, have happened if she didn't have that ability to unravel some of that old emotional trauma. So that's the beauty of Ayurveda and the beauty of Ayurvedic cleansing is that we, we go to the root of that. And, and the Colorado Cleanse talks about self-inquiry exercises. We start to help slowly, gently pull the fat out, give you access to those old emotional traumas so you can see what you created as a result of that and what is underneath it. And what's underneath it is your joy. Underneath all the emotional armor that we all talk about these days is who we truly are. We're not trying to get something you don't have. We're just trying to give you access and take away the protective armor that was very, very needed and very, very um, uh, necessary when you were younger and through your childhood but now as an adult, you don't need that armor anymore. And when you become more clear and you're not always in survival, need more attention, more reward chemistry mode, and you're in the start to change into giving and being more of the love instead of needing the love, all of a sudden we start to get glimpses of becoming conscious. And we start to make decisions based on being conscious versus being unconscious, being love versus needing love. So just a really cool thing. And in recent months, I've been writing a lot of articles about some of the Ayurvedic techniques 
that were designed to increase neuroplasticity in the brain, which means the ability to change your brain, change your patterns, you know, breathing techniques, yoga, breathing, meditation, all designed to change your brain waves. It's hard science. They slow down your brain waves. As opposed to being in a fight or flight state, they slow you down. They create that inner eye of the storm, the calm, that supports your ability to handle stress like the winds of the storm. And the bigger the calm, the bigger you, calm you are on the inside, the more powerful your winds are, therefore productivity is on the outside. And that's what Ayurveda was really all about. So yoga, breathing techniques, even chanting, vibrational techniques, it's almost like if you wrote an emotional oppression on the white matter of your brain and the myelin sheaths, and they're recorded there. So like writing in sand, and you vibrate the sand, and when you vibrate the sand, those emotional oppressions are gone. Ayurveda was really all about not making you healthy physically, but to help, and not even to help you make you make you healthy mentally and emotionally. It was to help you reach a higher level of human potential. We only use 10% of our brain, and most of that is because we're walking around unconscious, doing the same dumb stuff again and again from impressions from the first six years of life. Man, can we do better than that? That's what Ayurveda is about. That's what Ayurveda cleansing is about is get rid of this ama physiologically. It's giving you joint pain and, and back pain and, and brain fog and mental ama making you emotionally feeling just like it's hard to handle the stress in your life. All these things were understood, which is just amazing to me that they figured all of that out, right? So, so breathing techniques, um, particularly pranayama breathing techniques are very powerful. And particularly the, the hold, the kumbhaka, it's called between the breath. When you hold your breath, that's been actually shown to have powerful, powerful therapeutic benefit, including increasing stem cells, Nobel Prize winning nitric oxide, EPO, the same stuff that Lance Armstrong was injecting and got caught and lost all his Tour de France medals. He, you can make it just by using pranayama with comfortable breath holds. It's called intermittent hypoxia. The research on that is just off the charts. It protects your genome. It protects your endothelial lining. It's just sort of amazing that this thousand-year-old technique called pranayama, and pranayama, prana means breath, and, and yama means to pause. So the pranayama technique was built originally around the pause of the breath. What kind of breathing you do on the inhale, what kind you do on the exhale, that has different effects physiology, but, but it isn't pranayama unless you actually do a breath hold, because that's what, that's what pranayama means. That's a little bit of a controversial statement for some yoga teachers, but if you read the Patanjali and the Yoga Pradipika, you'll see the, the, actual, the actual real definitions of those words are in fact breath and break or pause. So it's a break or a pause in the breath. And that is where all the new research is showing phenomenal benefit. So we, I've written a lot of articles on Bastrika and Kumbhaka. So please we, stay tuned to my weekly newsletters because I'm writing a ton about how to change these old mental emotional patterns of the brain. And so much of that has to do with changing neuroplasticity. And that happens with the breathing and with the holding. Chanting, prayer has been shown to create sort of a vibration. Singing, like Gregorian chants or singer, just praying, repeating, that vibration has the ability to create neuroplasticity and kind of rewrite that white matter uh, on the brain, which is just a really cool thing. Okay, so now we have this sort of understanding of how when you do something like the Colorado Cleanse, which we do twice a year, we do it as a group twice a year, so we can sort of hold your hand. You get emails every morning uh, to tell you what to do, and we have chat rooms and conference calls and question and answer sessions with me to help people get through that. You can also do the Colorado Cleanse anytime you like, uh, which is kind of really cool. You just get the book and you follow it step by step, and that's super easy. But the Colorado Cleanse was designed for a, a digestive reset, liver, lymph cleanse, a, a emotional restoration of, you know, of becoming once again conscious, restoration of the mental and emotional ama. Really cool. Okay, so now let's think about this a little bit deeper. The stress of those old childlike behaviors, they plow right through your gut, and they take out your intestinal uh, health. Your intestinal skin 
is sort of like the three little bears, right? Can't be too dry or you get constipated, can't be too wet or you get a little bit looser or mucusy stool, has to be sort of just right. So your intestinal mucosa has to be um, just right. You can't, and, and so what happens when the intestinal tract gets aggravated from stress, it gets dried out, the reaction to dryness, constipation, the reaction to that is make mucus, and then you have a looser stool, so your intestinal tract keeps going like that. Inside of your intestinal tract um, are little collecting ducts for your lymphatic system called lacteals, and, and they are uh, trying to do a handful of things. They're the garbage can, and they're also trying to deliver good broken down fats, monoglyceride fats, into every cell of your body as baseline energy. Okay. Now, if the intestinal lining has been broken down, you're not going to digest well efficiently and you're not going to detoxify well efficiently. So what happens when the lymph system gets congested as a result of poor digestion, <clears throat> this is the AMA, it builds up in the lymphatic system. The lion's share of the lymph in your body lines your intestinal tract. And if that lymph system is congested, the fats trying to deliver, be delivered as energy, <coughs> excuse me, will actually be dumped into the fat around your belly, which gives you a bigger belly. The limbs from your legs and your feet are trying to get back through those limbs in your belly, back to your heart, and that can back up lymph in your hips and your legs, giving you cellulite and extra weight in those areas as well. Then, so when the limbs get congested, you have these, this ama building up in the lower extremities because the, everything in the limbs trying to go up back to your heart to be recirculated back to your liver for detox. But if that's not working and the roads are blocked, you end up just building it and pushing it all into the fat in your legs or hips or belly, right? We also have limps on your, under your, underneath your skin. So on, these limps can become exit ramps for impurities. So you can get rashes in your hands and your feet, your body, your legs, your everywhere. Your skin becomes an exit ramp for those impurities. Your respiratory tract has skin epithelial lining as well. On the other side of that epithelial lining is going to be respiratory associated lymph or mucous membrane associated lymph. So wherever you have skin, this skin, the respiratory skin, the intestinal skin, you're going to have lymph vessels on the other side. And we also have lymphs in the brain that drain the three pounds of chemicals and plaque out of your head every year. So for some reason, if you have a, a, a digestive issues and you're not breaking your food down properly, you're going to start pushing undigested food toxins, AMA, into your lymphatic system. And that's going to start causing issues like in your joints and your skin and your energy will be low because your limbs trying to deliver energy, but the road is blocked so you can't get the energy. Your brain can't get rid of the three pounds of plaque every night while you sleep. So you get brain fog, cognitive decline, memory issues, things like that. So that's what happens when you're limp. But then you probably say, well, how do I know if I'm doing that? Well, you know that because if you uh, have food intolerances, this is probably the big one. If you don't handle eating certain foods very well, wheat and dairy and nuts and seeds and corns and legumes and beans and lectins, all of these have become sort of, you know, public enemies number one through 10 now. Everybody has a, a problem with some of these foods because they're harder to digest, right? So when you don't have really good digestive strength, those foods will go undigested into your small intestine. And those proteins and fats, and we're talking environmental pollutants from the mercury, from the coal mine plumes that are on every organic vegetable, all the environmental toxins, proteins that are in, like the, the, the anti-nutrients that are in all the things I just mentioned, the beans, legumes, all that, they will be too big to get into your blood because they weren't broken down in your stomach. So they get uptaken into the collecting ducts of your lymph. Your lymph gets congested, and then all these lymphatic AMO-related conditions begin to occur. In Ayurveda, we always treat the, the, the rasa which first. The rasa is a study of the lymphatic system. So lymph in Ayurveda is rasa. The study of rasa is called rasayana. In Ayurveda, one of the eight branches of Ayurveda is called rasayana, which is the study of longevity. So literally, the study of longevity is the study of, of the lymphatic system. 
And that's like really amazing, right? That the study of longevity is the study of lymph. And the very first thing we treat in Ayurveda is the rasa, the lymphatic system, which is the drains. If the drains are clogged and you've been not digesting your food properly, creating ama that's finding its way into the lymphatic system, it's gonna build up in your tissues, in your joints, your skin, your muscles, your organs, things are gonna to begin to accumulate, toxins are gonna to accumulate and begin to, you're gonna to begin to break down. Depending on how you're wired to break down, you kind of sort of will over time. So how do you know that that's happening? You know that because your digestive system, your elimination, your, your bowel movements have become compromised as well as your ability to handle certain foods. You just don't feel good. And you have extra weight around your belly or your hips, or your skin is rashing, or your brain fog is beginning to kick in, and your memory is a little bit less than it used to be. You're not as sharp. You don't have the energy as you once did. This is all ama related, and it's mental ama and the physical ama that's causing these things. So when your lymph system gets congested, then what happens, the toxins that are trying to get out through that lymph system, they can't do that anymore because the road's blocked. So they get redirected back to your liver. And then your liver starts to slowly become congested over time as well. And that's a bit of a problem because your liver is doing a handful of things. One thing it does is it makes bile. And bile, think of bile like a little Pac-Man that gobbles up and cleans all your intestinal villi. So it keeps the integrity of your intestinal tract working really well. So if you have a lot of undigested food coming down and then you have good bile flow, at least you're gonna clean it out and keep it from getting irritated and inflamed. But if you have the bile starting to become compromised and you lose your little cleaner fluid, your Pac-Man to scrub your intestinal skin, you end up um, having more intestinal irritation and more of leaky gut syndrome where the impurities can move through your intestinal wall into your lymph and into your blood even directly. But your liver makes bile also to buffer and neutralize the acid in your stomach. So when you eat a ham sandwich or something that you probably wouldn't eat, but if you did eat a ham sandwich, you would need a certain amount of acid to cook the gluten in the bread, and you would need a certain amount of bile to buffer or neutralize all that acid you need to cook the bread. You'd also need a certain amount of bile to emulsify the fat in the ham. So you eat a ham sandwich, your stomach goes, whoa, there's a lot of bread here and there's a lot of fat in the ham here. I'm gonna need four ounces of bile. And they send the message to the liver, liver doesn't respond. Liver is congested because the bile has been cloggy and sludgy for a very long time. The bile, not only does it scrub your intestinal skin, but it makes you go to the bathroom. It regulates the consistency of your stool. So if you haven't been going to the bathroom very efficiently, not complete elimination, you're not scrubbing your intestinal villi, all those toxins go back to your liver, your liver gets congested, your bile becomes thick, and now there's no bile to neutralize your acid. So your stomach says, don't worry about it, I'm good. I'll just hold on to the ham sandwich a little longer, I'll wait for you guys to turn the green light on, let me know when the bile's ready to emulsify this fat and neutralize that acid. And mm, nothing happens. So your stomach holds on to the food longer than it should, Ayurveda called this Udvarta, upward moving digestion, which means that you're now holding onto this acid and eventually you can get heartburn and indigestion as a result of that. But over time, if this continues to be very chronic, your stomach says, you know what? They're not making down there the bile like they did in the old days. So I'm gonna start to dial down my production of acid because you dialed down the production of the bile. So now my whole upper digestive strength starts to weaken. So now, you have no chance to digest or detoxify because you need stomach acid for digesting the proteins, fats, you know, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the, the wheat, the dairy, the proteins in the wheat and the dairy, the nuts, the seeds, the beans, legumes, all that lectins, that's all protein. You need a really strong acid to break that down. And you need really good bile to neutralize that acid. And you re need really good bile to emulsify all the heavy metals, environmental pollutants, which are fat soluble. So all of a sudden, because of what we just described, mental ama causing intestinal issues, causing lymphatic issues, and then causing liver issues, you have a shutdown of your ability to make the acid you need to cook these hard to digest foods so you just stop eating them and you feel a little bit better. So I don't eat wheat and dairy and all these foods because I just feel better when I don't. Of course, that's a smart thing to do, but we haven't fixed anything. We haven't fixed or unraveled the whole problem. And that's what the Ayurvedic is really all about. 
That's why the Ayurvedic cleanses are so important because they don't just go and clean you out and give you a detox. They actually reset function, reset stomach acid, reset bile flow, reset pancreas and duodenal enzyme production, reset lymphatic flow off your intestine, like repair, support, heal your intestinal lining. This is all what the Ayurvedic cleanses are about. So it's much more of a comprehensive approach to looking at that while you're burning the fat and detoxifying, we're also releasing molecules of motion that are stored in our fat and our brain and our tissues that do make us think and do the same dumb stuff again and again and again. So it's like, wow, they thought all this out? It's just amazing to me that they did and they figured all that out. So what happens is that we have, and even if it didn't even come from the stress of your life, which we all have our, our version of that, you know, the number one abdominal surgery today in America is gallbladder removal surgery, which is because we have so many highly processed foods, preservatives in our food, particularly polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are oils from seeds, sunflower seeds and rape seeds like canola oil and, uh, and uh, other seeds, sunflower seeds, things like that. Um, all of that are... The, the, seed, the oil in those seeds, corn oil, all that, are very, very volatile. So when you squeeze that oil out of that and they press it, um, that oil goes rancid very, very quickly. So to stabilize it, they have to bleach it and boil it and deodorize it, and they can pretty much kill everything in it. And then they put it in a bottle in the grocery store shelf, and you're supposed to use that to cook with them. We were told that's much better than the saturated fats from the cholesterol rising days, and we're going to give you these new oils which actually didn't do anything. They actually do help lower your cholesterol, but they actually increase the rate of heart disease on the planet, which is a little bit of a problem. And we have an epidemic of heart disease now taking place with young people between 34 and 64 years of age. All of a sudden, heart disease is now exploding to a much younger generation, which is also often due to, again, the processed foods and a breakdown of the digestive system. Because if your liver is sluggish, you can't get rid of the, you can't deliver the good fat, and you can't get rid of the bad fat. And so the number one surgery is to pull your gallbladder out. So your gallbladder is so critical. It's sort of like the final straw in this whole process. If that liver got congested, you don't make any bile, you're eventually not gonna make any acid, and then you're not gonna be able to cook or digest your food very well. Proteins in all those foods I mentioned will go undigested into your small intestine. They'll be too big to get into your blood and that end up going into the collecting ducts of your lymph and will create ama that builds up in your lymph and your lymph is in your brain, on your respiratory tract, your skin, and around your intestinal tract. And next thing you know, you've got some real, some real problems there <clears throat> that are, are you know, in desperate need of what people think as a cleanse, but it's really important to understand that we need to do more than just cleanse the body. We need to reset function. We need to be more than just take the food out of the diet. Um, we need to reset function. You know, people say, well, I feel so much better when I don't eat wheat. Well, the, the harder to digest foods, the, the, the wheat and, and the dairy and, and even poisonous foods like nightshades and oxalates and goitrogens and, and lectins and anti-nutrients and things like that, those are all irritating foods for our intestinal tract. And those irritating foods actually cause and trigger and are responsible for what's called gut immunity, which is 70% of our immune response. <clears throat> so if you take all those foods out of your diet and you're not irritating your intestinal tract to create an immune response, you oftentimes don't get one. And that is really interesting science. And it's come in now. Studies have shown that when people eat wheat, they have four times less mercury in their blood than people who are gluten-free. People who eat wheat have significantly more killer T cells in their bloodstream measure of immunity than people who are gluten-free. People who eat wheat have more good bugs, less bad bugs than people who are gluten-free. Two big major harbor studies, both 30 years in the making, both over 100,000 people, show that people who eat the most gluten have the least amount of heart disease in one study and the least amount of diabetes in the other. Now, David Perlmutter's book, The Grain Brain, I debated him twice. My mother said I won both those debates. He's a good friend of mine, and uh, I think some of the stuff he says is brilliant, but I think that he says that, that wheat causes diabetes, and I think that wheat has been shown to not cause diabetes. Whole grains have been shown to lower the risk of diabetes, but processed wheat, 
with all the oil in it, that's poisonous. When you look at the label of your bread, <coughs> look at the label of your bread, it'll say sunflower oil in there or some type of oil in there. It could be expeller press something oil. It's still baked. It's still rancid. It's still there to make the bread stay squishy for months and months and months. Bread in the old days would get hard in a day because there was no oil in it. There was no preserves in it, pre preservatives in it. They used those highly processed bleach, boiled, deodorized, polyunsaturated fatty acids to preserve foods on the shelf so they could have grocery stores. That's why we have grocery stores, because of that ability to make things last on a shelf. Before that, they didn't have grocery stores. They had like a beef, a butcher, and a, and a cheese shop, and a, you know, and a vegetable store. It was, that's how it was. And it was all fresh because it had to be brought in every day. So the, 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 the problem is, is that um, these polyunsaturated fatty acids, they are preservatives and they make the bread stay squishy on the shelf for like ever, right? And when you put that bread inside of your body, the bugs didn't want to eat it on the counter. They didn't, that's why the bread never went bad. But when you put it inside your body, the bugs and microbes inside of you won't eat it either. And they eat, that's what they eat. They eat fat. That's what the microbes eat is fat. So as a result, all those indigestible fats go right to your liver. They congest your liver, your gallbladder, and that's the king, one of the kingpins of your digestive strength. And that's another reason why we have these problems, which is why you have to absolutely make sure you're not eating any of those processed foods. Look at the labels. If you see any type of oil in it, you just want to avoid that at all costs. And then, you know, every season, at least do a cleanse that resets digestive function, resets liver function, cleanses out your bile flow, cleans out your liver and your lymph and your repairs, your intestinal lining, so the good bugs can proliferate the way they were designed. Um, and then at the same time, with the Ayurvedic cleanse, whether you do our Colorado cleanse or our short home cleanse, which is four days, or our Kaya Kalpa cleanse, which is five days, the Colorado cleanse is two weeks, they all have a component to help us support the, you know, the unraveling of the mental ama. So the goal of Ayurveda was to get rid of the mental and the emotional and the physiological digestive ama so we are not building up toxins, which are really the body's sort of protective armor way, way of armoring up in some emotional way. So, you know, we always hear that, that stress somehow impacts our body. Well, now under Ayurveda has laid down a mechanism for that and there's some pretty amazing hard science to back that up. So this year, think about taking a look at our Colorado cleanse. Um, if you haven't done it before, we do the group cleanse where I can guide you through the process personally. Um, and if you've done it a bunch of times, you know, think about um, doing it. It's just two weeks out of your life, but it's two weeks of rebuild and rejuvenation that, uh, that um, you know, pays dividends way down the road. Many folks who come into that cleanse can't eat wheat or dairy or gluten, and then when they're done, they have the ability to pull that off. Why? Because we reset function. We didn't just take the food out of the diet and think everything's good. Because not taking care of the cause can set you up for real problems down the road. Like I said, taking those foods out, there was four times more mercury in the blood with people who were gluten-free than people who ate wheat. So that's just sort of like where, where, where you know, we, we have short-term gain but long term, we're setting ourselves, for, setting ourselves up for a real problem because your ability to digest well and detoxify well are the same pathway. So if you're not digesting well, just remember, that means you're not, if you're not digesting well, you're not detoxifying well. And that in an environment with 400 billion pounds of toxic chemicals dumped in the very American environment every year, we need that digestive slash detox ability. So and that's what these cleanses are really all about. They're not about cleansing, they're about reset function, as well as kind of giving ourselves a clean slate so we don't have all the ama built up in our tissues. Okay, uh, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. I'm Dr. John Deyard. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.